I want to talk to you this morning about the will of God. The will of God. Praise God. Lord, it's not what we think it is. It's not what we think it is. Lord, we're thinking that your will has everything to do about our, us and our little situation, our little corner piece of the earth. God, it's bigger. It's bigger. It's bigger. Forgive us for thinking so highly of ourselves that your will is all about us. You're just sitting up there waiting, Lord, for us to beckon you. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. We begin with John 1.10. He, speaking of the Son of God, was in the world. And the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Back up in the third verse, it tells us that all things were made by Christ. And without Him, there was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 tells us that all things were created by Christ and for Christ. He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. And again, please think, think a little higher than just your little circle. Think a little higher than that. Let's think about the universe. Let's think about nations. Let's think about all these things. Weather patterns, all things. Revelation 4.11 tells us that God created all things. And for His pleasure, His pleasure, they are and were created. Did He create us? Yes. What were we created for? For His pleasure. If we could ever get that right. And come to understand that we're not here for our pleasure. But we were created for His pleasure. And when it says that God created all things. It's understood that that includes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who are all, who are all God and they're co-equal. In Genesis it says, and God said, let us make man. In our own image. It's not to be thought amazing that the creation did not know him that created them. They didn't know the one that created them. Verse 11. And he, Christ, came into his own and his own received him not. They were Christ's own because he created them. And because he had chosen the Jewish, for two reasons, he created them and he had chosen that Jewish race that, to come and live among as his own people. He gave them the law. He did all these things throughout hundreds of years. Now, if we are one with Christ, then our own people will also not know us or receive us. You have to know that. Quit trying to get them to. Quit worrying about what they think about you. Jesus said, if they hated me, they'll hate you. We might say, well, not my family, not my friends. Folks, they did it. All of them did it to Jesus. All of them. Verse 12, but as many as received him, Christ, to them, he, Christ, gave power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. It is a sad thing that people think all he did was come to give us power to get something. To have something. To be somebody. But he gave us power to become the sons of God. When I say be somebody, I mean in this earth. In the realm of the earth. The possibility of us becoming a son of God is the eternal intention, purpose, and will of God. Before the foundations of the world, that was what he settled. We know this through many scriptures. Another one would be Romans 8, 29. For whom he far knew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That he, his son, might be the firstborn among many brethren. We've got to get this straight, what our purpose is. Why he created us. Why we're here. Why we're breathing. It's not for our own pleasure. It's for His pleasure. I know that people don't like that. They think this is about them. And they want it to be about them. And they try to make it be about them. And sometimes we're caught up in that. Now, that's so us becoming a son of God is the eternal intention, purpose, and the will of God. Does there, Is everybody going to become a son of God? Certainly not. Because they don't want His will. We don't want to cooperate with His will. To think that we are invited to become a son of God is incredible. You know that? It's just absolutely incredible. 
No other creation has that invitation, that hope. To reject that invitation is suicidal on an eternal basis. For there's no other name, meaning image, image of Christ under heaven whereby we must be saved. It's, it's him or it's nothing. It's no one. Now who will give Christ power to become a, a son of God? Who will Christ give power to become a son of God? Who's he going to give it to? Only to those who believe on and receive the image of his person. People say, I believe on Jesus, I believe in Jesus, but they will not receive the image of his person. They say, I receive Christ. Oh, we receive what we think Christ is, what we want to make him. That's what people do. They want to make him out to be a Christ of their own design. Most modern translations remove the word power, power to become a son of God, change it to the word authority or right, which changes the meaning of this scripture. We may have a right or authority to become something, to do something, whatever, but without the power to become or to do, it will never happen. I can sit there all day and wish I could lift a car. But if I don't have the power to lift the car, I may have a, somebody come along and tell you, I give you the authority to lift that car. By yours, I just lift it up. But if I don't have the power, it's not going to happen. Now, I'm telling you, we're talking about the salvation of our soul. It's going to take more power to do that than it would be to lift up a car. With your hand. Amen? Without the power to become, it'll never happen. Especially the power to come out of darkness into His glorious light. And some people, most people don't even realize they're in darkness. And, and, and most people don't even know there is a glorious light. But that's what the gospel came to tell us and to explain to us. We may have a right or authority, but we must have the power. The absolute need for the power to become the Son of God is also found in Acts 1.8. And you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you to become a witness unto Christ or be transformed into the image of Christ. It doesn't mean go out and do something for Him. It's to become what He is. Verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. Now, not of blood means that just because our earthly father or mother received Christ does not make us a son of God. We can't ride to heaven on our parents' coattail or anybody else's, husband, wife, anyone. For the new birth in Christ cannot be transferred through human blood. Then he says, nor the will of the flesh. No one was born into this earth a son of God. And in fact, we're all born in sin. Psalm 51, 5 says, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my, did my mother conceive me. Now this is not saying that our conception was sinful, but rather we were all born with a lawless and sinful nature. Genesis 6, 5 says that every imagination of the thoughts of men's heart was only continually evil. We're coming to that place again, only continually evil. You know, things get uncovered in the news media. Or maybe you hear about somebody and you just can't, uh, that kind of thing is going on. Oh my God, that kind of thing. In John 8, 44, Jesus said that every person that is not born of God is a child of the devil. Not a son of God, a child of the devil. If we're not born of the Spirit and born of God. Verse 13 which were born again, I'm going to read that again, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. We see here three wills, the will of the flesh, the will of men, and the will of God. The will of the flesh has to do with the affections and lust of the flesh or sexual desire. Not born of that. We can't be born of that. He told Nicodemus, you got to be born again. He said, I go back in my mother's womb and be born again? How can I do that? He wasn't talking about such a thing. So you must be born of the water, that's the natural birth. You must be born of the spirit, that's the spiritual birth. The flesh nature of every human is carnal, it's corrupt, it is opposed to God, it is opposite to everything that is spiritually good. I want to put this in here, the reason I'm preaching this. A few weeks ago, maybe about a month now, a burden to pray for the will of God to be done in this earth as it is done in heaven. It came, it came mildly upon me. I mean, I don't know how to explain it exactly, but that, that prayer was just pouring out of me and pouring out of me from deep in me. 
Your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. Your will be done. Just praying that your will be done. But then a few days ago, I was again praying for the will of God to be done. And I'm going to confess to you this morning, I felt something rise up in me against that prayer. I mean, I could just feel it rise up against that prayer. I knew what it was. It's my flesh. It's my flesh trying to be in charge. I don't want the will of God. I want my will. That's what that was. I could feel it. I mean, absolutely feel it. Made me aware there's something that's against the will of God being done in my life or in this world. That's why people don't want to pray. They don't want to read the word because they're confronted with the will of God. That's something that rose up with me, within me was so very real. And I recognized it to be my flesh nature that did not want to be in subjection to the will of God in my own life. Now Paul also found within himself that he found that opposing, that thing that was opposing the will of God being done in him. Romans chapter 7. He said, I find a law in me. When I do right, I end up doing wrong. And so we'll all be confronted with that opposing force within him. Let me, you know that. And let me remind you that. There's something in every one of us that does not want the will of God to be done. And it's in us. It's that close. It'll fight tooth and toenail, it'll grab, snatch, claw, cry, whine, manipulate. The will of men does not have the power to birth Christ in them. We're talking about now the will of men. We talked about the will of the flesh, now the will of men. We can do all the things that men tell us to do and yet never be born of the Spirit. Never be born of the Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can birth Christ in us and birth us in Christ. Only the Holy Spirit. The flesh and the will of man cannot and will not change us into the image of Christ. Oh, they're trying to do it. They got programs, they got books, videos, they got everything to try to change people. You got to be in this 12-step program. It's the answer. It is not the answer. It's only the work of the Holy Spirit alone. Scripture says, can, can a leper change its spots or take its spots off? Can, 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 the, can the animal change the color of its skin? No, neither can we change our heart. Now, is, I want to ask a question this morning. Is God's will important to him, or how important is it to him? Is it okay with him that we just go ahead and do what we want to do? Well, some think, I'll just go ahead and do what I want to do, and then I'll just ask God to forgive me. Acts 13, 22. And when God had removed Saul, King Saul, king of Israel, he raised up to them David to be their king to whom also God gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. All my will. It's very important that we hear that, all my will. Now, God has tested, throughout the scripture, God testifies about certain men. He testified about Abraham twice. Very significant when he told him to take his only son and sacrifice him. And then he testified and he said, Now I know that you fear me. And then again when he was walking and met Abraham, this is before his son was born on, on the plain of Mamre. He, and, and the Lord and two angels, they were all going to go to Sodom. They came and talked to Abraham first. That's, that's uh, the mercy of God. And so as God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is who this is, who is God, was walking away, he said, shall I hide this thing, thing from Abraham? He turned around and told Abraham what he's going to do. But he said, shall I hide this from him, seeing that he shall order his house after me, or his family after me? And that, and that so impressed God that he was willing. See, that was God's testimony about him. And we go, go through many other people in the word of God, God gave testimony to now the Lord has sent Saul on a mission to fight against it and utterly destroy the Amalekites and all they possess. Everything. Wipe it out. Don't take anything. Just like similar to Jericho. Don't take anything. You know what happens to people who violate that? Achan did that. But Saul did not obey the voice of God. Rather, he kept the king alive and took all their best things, best animals, 
Thus he did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's what the scripture says in 1 Samuel 15. But not fully doing the will of God, it grieved the Lord that he had made Saul king. Now is it important to God that we do his will? Not only do part of it, but that we do all of it. It grieved God that Saul didn't fully do the will of God. How many know that it's not a wise thing to grieve the Lord? Have you learned that yet? Have I learned that yet? It's not wise to grieve the Lord. By the way, the scripture says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit by whom we're sealed in the day of redemption. He's the last one you want to grieve. Now, God had made King Saul, but it grieved him. How many know that it's not wise? It'd be better to grieve every human being on earth and to lose everything we own, and to lose even our own life, than to ever grieve the Lord. I'll just play this little game, see if it'll work out for me. I'm going to do my will. It won't work. Because God did not fully do, because Saul did not fully do the will of God, he rejected the voice of God. Scripture says, Therefore God rejected him, tore the kingdom away from him, and gave it to David, who God said would fully do the will of God. Why did Saul not fully do the will of God, but David would fully do the will of God? Why is that? Ephesians 6.6 6 says, Not as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. From the heart. It's in my heart. Is it in your heart? Is it in our hearts to fully do the will of God? A true servant of Christ does the will of God from their heart. If we do not fully do the will of God from our heart, then we're not a servant of Christ care what people tell, tell us we are, what we think we are. Well, I thought, well, the difference was that David had a heart to fully do the will of God, but Saul's heart was bent on doing his own will. As much as he could thought he could get away with. And therefore, Saul had no problem disobeying the voice of the Lord because his heart wasn't in it. What kind of heart do we have? Do we have a heart to fully do the will of God? Or is our heart set on doing our own will? The Lord's testimony concerning David was that he would fully do the will of God instead of his own will. What's the Lord's testimony concerning you and I this morning? And let me tell you something. He's got a testimony concerning us. You better know it. It's called a book. He knows our being accepted or rejected by the Lord depends upon the testimony of the Lord concerning our heart in this matter of fully doing the will of God. Well, I go to church once a month. I go once a week. I do this. I do that. No, praise God. Fully do the will of God. And we're not even talking about church attendance. Saul so blamed the people, saying it was their fault that he did not fully do the will of God. He said the people. What did that mean? It meant that Saul was a men pleaser instead of a God pleaser. He was king. Kings have absolute rule. 1 Peter 4, 2, that we no longer should live the rest of our time in the flesh, doing the lusts or the desires of men, but doing the will of God. Doing the will of God. We, we, we all spend our time doing either our own will or the will of others or the will of God. But it cannot be some sort of combination of our will, their will, and God's will. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Praise God. Not, not what I think His will is, but what He's working out in our lives. His will. We will never be a witness unto Christ unless our words and our actions demonstrate the perfect will of God to this world instead of our conforming to this world. We have a choice. Acts 21, 14. And when he would not be persuaded, it's talking about the Apostle Paul. He was headed toward Jerusalem, everybody, there's prophecies, prophets coming, there's prophesying, don't go, you're, you're, you're going to suffer, you're going to be in prison if you go. But he said, I must go, and he, and he would not be persuaded, and then it said, we cease saying, and we said, the will of the Lord be done. Now, if you set out to do the will of God and to do it fully, 
Not everyone's going to agree with that. People are going to press, pressure you, bribe you. I know this is so. They'll do all kinds of things. I've seen it right here, people. People don't sit here now because somebody bribed them, somebody threatened them, somebody, you know. Yes, others will press us to do what they think is the will of God for our lives. But we must stand on the word of the Lord spoken to us and confirmed to us and not be persuaded to do otherwise, even by well-meaning family or friends. Now, I know that a lot of people might take what I just said and use it to reject godly warnings so that they can do what they think is right. That's not what we're saying. We're talking about confirmed, biblically based. We're talking about really God's will, not something that we think it ought to be. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Folks, that's very powerful. That's powerful. Well, who's going to heaven? Is it those who repeat a prayer, join a church, profess Christ as their personal Savior, like a personal trainer or financial advisor, or who believe a doctrine? Well, I believe. I'm a believer. Well, does that mean you're going to heaven? We do all those things and many more things for the church or for others, including casting out devils, healing the sick, raising the dead, or other wonderful miracles and signs. And yet, if we fail to fully do the will of God, then we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's just as plain as it can be. You know, Brother Clinton and told of a, they asked him to go see a dying preacher. He's an elderly man on his deathbed. And they said, you got to go to something's wrong, something's wrong. He's so anxious. He's, he's just so anxious. And, and you know, he should be dying in peace. He's a man of God, but he's so anxious. So Brother Clinton went to him and tried to console him, talk to him. Uh, but he got nowhere with the man. He was so almost violently anxious about dying. He walked out of there and he said, I'm on a fast till God tells me what's going on here. I don't know what's going on here. He said that answer was quick and immediately. The Lord told him it's because I told him to do something and he didn't do it and he knows he's about to face me. He didn't do it and he's about to face me and he knows it. What's that called? The will of God. God tells us to do something that is the will of God. It's not all the will of God, but it is the will of God. Acts 19, 13, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took it upon themselves to call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And there are seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, a chief of the priests, which did so. So they got this one man in there. They're going to cast one devil out of him. And they say, We adjure you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped upon them and overcame them and prevailed against all seven of them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Let us not presume and take it upon ourselves. See, the scripture says they took it upon themselves. We think this is the will of God and this is what we're going to do. We saw somebody else doing it. must be the will of God. That's what we're going to do. But we must not be presumptuous or formulate an assumed will of God out of our own opinions and desires. Well, I just don't think that's what God wants. I don't think that's the will of God. You know what? What I think you think doesn't matter. <laughs> it just really doesn't matter. John 7, 17. In fact, it can get us in a lot of trouble. John 7, 17. If any man is willing to do God's will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. This is important. If any man's willing to do God's will, he shall know. God will only reveal his will to those who are already doing his will. Folks, he's not going to waste his time telling his will to people that he knows is not going to do his will. Haven't done his will, have no intention of doing his will. He's not going to cast his pearl before the swine. As we obey and practice doing the known will of God, we, we can know, we can read that word, the written word, and
and know what is. And we start there and we do what that word says. We're doing the will of God. Then we'll be able to discern those things that are as yet unknown. We do the known, then he can show us the unknown will. Or uncertain things concerning what is the will of God. Do, do, you, do we get that? If you're not even trying to do what you know is the will of God, why do we think he's going to show us his will? Do we really think that God is going to reveal his holy, eternal, divine will, purpose, and intention to those who have not proven in the past that they'll do his will? Now, I want to talk to you about Christ and the will of the Father. John 4, 34. Jesus said unto them, My food. What does he mean? My sustenance, nourishment, sustainment, support, my bread and butter is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. I've watched people say all kinds of things of what they're going to do. Declare it. Stand. I've seen them stand up in this church. A man used to, one time, he'd, he'd stand up in this church, and I'm, you know, and I've seen another, I'm, well, I'll tell you what. When things came, and they, and women too now, please, and had to make a decision, they made the decision on the side of what they thought or who they thought was their bread and butter, their sustenance, and they ran with that instead of doing the will of God. They didn't believe God. They didn't believe God would sustain them if they chose His will over their will. People get kicked out of their house. They're going to lose their job. They're going to lose their friends, maybe lose their freedom. I think it's happening right now all over this world. People are making that decision. I read of that one young um, Muslim young lady, and she made a decision, and she lost her life. Many are losing their life. And we sit over here so comfortable getting everything we want pretty much. And we're not willing to give it up to do His will. I tell you, the, real, the test is coming on that, folks. The test is coming. Jesus is saying that doing the will of his heavenly father is what sustains him. They're trying to get him to eat. You know, he's there at the well at Sychar. They, gone in, they went into town to get food, came back. He's talking to that Samaritan woman. They're trying to urge him to eat. And they, he said, I, I'm not hungry. And they said, well, who brought him something to eat? The Holy Spirit was moving in him. Speaking to him, I mean, he, he said, that my bread and butter, my food, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. If we do not fully do the will of God, then we cannot finish the work that God's given each of us to do. Of course, the problem there is people doing what they think the will of God is. John 5, 30, I can of my own self do nothing. Jesus speaking. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just or right or correct, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. May we all come to the place where we only seek to know and to do the will of God, never our own will. May we come to that place. I'm telling you, that's what God intends, that's what God demands, that's what He wants. We cannot make the right decisions unless we can hear what the will of God is in the situation. Isn't that right? If you don't know His will, you can't do His will. And we cannot hear unless we're diligently seeking to do His will. Not our own will. Jesus said, I do His will. He said, I can hear what the Father is saying and I can make right judgment because I'm seeking to do His will. God knows this morning if I, if you are seeking to do His will. He knows what or who our life is all about. John 6, 38, For I came, Jesus speaking, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Jesus Christ was never self-willed, but his desire and purpose on this earth was to do the will of his Father, who had sent him to do his will. If we get our will, or if we get what we want, then God 
will not get his will or what he wants. You gotta, you gotta hear that. If I get what I want, God will not get what he wants. Oh, I thought we'd make a deal with God. You know, I'll scratch his back and scratch mine. You know, I'll give him something, he'll give me something. No. Galatians 5, 17 plainly states that our will is contrary to God's will. So if I get what I want or what I will, then God's not going to get what he wants or what he wants because they're contrary. And in fact, they oppose each other and they war. What I want, what my flesh wants, wars against the will of God. Our self-will is rooted in our flesh. And Romans seven eighteen says there's nothing good that dwells in our flesh and that includes our will. Jesus didn't say that he came to love people or to bless people or to right wrongs, but he declared that he came to do one thing only, and that was to do the will of his Father in heaven. You know, uh, here's an example. Jesus was, was teaching. This man interrupts him. He's teaching life. His words he's speaking are life-giving words, spirit life. This man interrupts him and said, Would you please make my brother divide the inheritance with me? And Jesus looked at him and said, Man, who made me a judge over these things? I didn't, what's Jesus? I didn't come to do that junk. I came to do the will of my Father. I'm not here to right your wrongs. The will of God being done by people on this earth is more important than the love of God for those people. Hear that. His love does not trump His will. We're not the center of the universe. All things do not revolve around us and ours. Again, all things were made by Christ and for Christ, not for us or for our pleasure or for our benefit. You have to hear that. Well, I don't like that. <laughs> Just don't like it. See what that gets you. Start to say something, but I can't say it here. In Luke 13, 6, Jesus spoke a parable. A man planted a fig tree in his vineyard. He came and sought fruit there, and he found none. He said to the gardener, For three years I've been looking for fruit from this tree, and I've not found any, not one fig. Let it be cut down. Why is it taking up space? Let's put something there that will produce. And the gardener answered, said to him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I dig around it and fertilize it. And if after that it has fruit, it is well. If not, let it be cut down. Anything and anyone that does not give the Lord pleasure will be rejected. We have to give him pleasure. It's not about us having pleasure. Hear me this morning. We have to give him pleasure. We were created for that. Well, where do I fit in that? It's not about you. It's not about me. We're complete in Christ. That's where we're complete. Not in all this other. Fruit is not our works now. It's not works we do. Working for the church, doing things. But our being transformed into the image of Christ, that Christ might have many brothers to present to his Father. That's the fruit he's looking for. Now that doesn't mean you go out and get as many people as you can to come to church, and that's your fruit. That doesn't mean bake a cave for Aunt Sally because she's not feeling well. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about doing the will of God. Now the will of God may be that you bake her a cake. Matthew twelve fifty. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. Oh, praise God. See, we're not even his brother and sister. We're not even his unless we do the will of his Father which is in heaven. We must produce, what is fruit? To produce the likeness of the image of the person of Christ. We'll either do that or we'll be removed and replaced. That's the message of this parable. Hebrews 6, 7, For land that is drunk in the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from the Lord. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it's worthless and near to being cursed and its end is to be burned. 
This parable is to show us that we as plants, now there is a planting of the Lord, but we as plants are not the important thing. We're not the important thing. But rather that every plant produce a harvest useful to the one who owns the land. And we don't own the land. It's all about us producing what he wants. His will. Years ago, the Lord told me if I didn't do his will here at this church in Peerless, that he would remove me and put someone else here who would do his will. He made that very plain to me. I've never forgot that. He's done that many, many times before with others. He removed Saul and replaced him with David. And you can just go down the list. What you think is important and what I think is important doesn't really matter, folks. What matters is the will of God being done on this earth as it is in heaven. John 8, 29, And he that sent me is with me. This is Christ speaking. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please Him. If we will do the will of God from our heart, then the Father will not leave us alone. But if we rebel, and rebellion is witchcraft, the sin of witchcraft, and if we do our will, that's what, exactly what the Lord told Saul. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, because he didn't fully do the will of God. If we rebel and do our own will, or only partially do His will, then He will leave us alone to ourselves, to our own devices, and ultimately to desolation. That's what He told Jerusalem. Luke twenty two forty two, 42, saying, Father, if you be willing, remove this. Jesus speaking, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Our will must always and in everything be subjugated to God's will. We must constantly and consistently make our own will subservient to God's will. We, if we have to, we, and we do, we have to force our will to submit or to be subdued to God's will. It means the difference between life and death. Now what to pray for? Jesus' disciples asked him to teach him to pray. And so the Lord taught them and us that prayer is for us to begin our prayer with the following. Now, whatever you think, it's not God help me pay my bills. It is give us our daily bread. It's not a lot of things that people are praying about. But here's the beginning. I'm just going to give you the beginning. First two verses. Matthew 6, 9. After this manner, Jesus is talking to them. He's teaching them, therefore pray. How many believe we ought to pray like he says pray? This is the way he said pray. Our Father which are in heaven, hallowed or holy be your name. Establishing who he is, what he is. Your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, what is his kingdom? God's kingdom is his government. And his government is his son, Jesus Christ. He's going to rule and reign over this earth. Righteous judgment. Now, he said, your kingdom come. This, in Revelation, we read the spirit of the bride, which is the church, the real church, says, come quickly, Lord Jesus, even so come quickly. We think this means this prayer is that before we do something, we should ask the Father if it's His will. But the will of God is more than should I buy Ford or Chevrolet. Or should I eat vanilla ice cream or chocolate ice cream. The will of God is more important than where we work. Or what we know, our opinions, or who we should be like or not be like. The will of God is more than should I have this or should I have that. The will of God is more important than how I feel about things or other people. You know, some people say, oh, Lord, I just want your will. But when it's not working the way we want it, we'll twist some things and tighten some things and tweak some things. So the will. But we pray, Lord, your will be done. The will of God is more important than how I feel about things or other people. The will of God is infinitely higher 
than what dominates our thinking. The will of God is more important than our struggles. The will of God certainly has greater purpose than our human purposes. We waste a lot of time, money, and energy on things that have nothing to do with the will of God. Nothing to do with it. Or the fulfillment of His will. Our will is up and down, but the will of God is always stable. Our will brings death, but God's will brings life. Our will changes our circumstances, but the will of God is forever with our circumstances. Our, our will changes with our circumstances, but the will of God is forever settled and it never changes. Our will is temporary, but the will of God is eternal and always remains the same. I'm just trying to tell you this morning, folks. There is a higher prayer. Your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Okay. I'm going to pray about this little, should I get a 30-inch TV or a 52-inch TV? God, what is your will? I'm going to go to Walmart. If they're out of one of them, I know you want me to get the other one. Come on, folks. Stop this stuff. <laughs> Why aren't we praying for His will to be done in earth as it is in heaven? Because we're too busy with our little thing. I'm going to give you these a few verses here and then I'm finished. Colossians, Colossians 1 9. For this cause we also, since the day that we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you. It's Apostle Paul talking to that church. And to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Oh, we've got to be filled with the knowledge of his will, folks. We have to be. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 in everything giving thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. See, that's one place we can start with the known will of God and, and do that. And then God sees, hey, this person does my will. I'll tell them my will. He, the unknown will. Hebrews 10, 36, for you have need of patience. Hear this, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. And this is a promise sometimes. We've done what God told us to do. We obeyed Him. We did His will. And nothing seems to be working. If anything, it's getting worse. He said, you just need patience. Are we hearing that? We need patience. And finally, this one. Hebrews 13, 21. Make you perfect in every good work to do His will. Working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Do we want God to make us perfect in every good work to do his will? Is that what is that what we're most people just signed up to get out of going to hell? Signed up to get to go to heaven, have one of those mansions, walk on those streets of gold? Or did we sign up? to do the will of God and stop doing our own will. Will you stand with me? Praise God, praise God. Some may say, I don't like this message. And I'm not just talking to the congregation here. There's people going to watch this and read this over the internet. And I'm conscious that I'm also talking, the Holy Spirit's talking to them through me. Father, forgive us. Forgive us for doing our own will. Forgive us for making our life all about ourselves, what we want, what pleases us, our pleasure, our comfort, our glory, our fame, our, our reputation. And you made yourself of no reputation. You called us, Lord, to do your will. Jesus says, my Father sent me, so send I you. Jesus said, I came to do the will of him that sent me. Help us, Lord, to come into that. Help us, Lord. I just ask you this morning, are you doing the will of God? 
what he's shown you to do, what he's told you to do. I, I, want, I, want, to, I want to say this. I'm not saying that you got to sit and read your Bible 24-7 and pray 24-7. You can't do anything else. I'm not saying that. But I am saying it better be the will of God, whatever you're doing, whatever I'm doing. It's a straight and narrow way. Few there be that find it. But the way that leads to destruction, he said, there's many on it. It's broad. It's broad. Broad meaning do what you want to do. Praise God. Would you come this morning? We'll pray for you.